in any conflict. Your fate will depend on your actions. War crimes will be prosecuted. War criminals will be punished. And it will be no defense to say, I was just following orders. I would like to introduce the next speaker whom I'm very delighted to meet. I've heard so much about her, Nadia El Ali. She's a social anthropologist of Iraqi origin and senior lecturer at the University of Exeter, Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. She's specialized in women and gender issues in the Middle East and has been working on the impact of war and economic sanctions on women in Iraq. She's also a founding member of Act Together, Women's Action in Iraq, and a member of Women in Black in UK. Recently, she's been commissioned by Z Publishers to write a book on the modern history of Iraqi women from the 1950s to today. Please. Thank you, Aisha, and I also would like to take the opportunity and thank all those who've made this event possible and for inviting me. Now, um, the title of my paper is Gender and War, the Plight of Iraqi Women. And you've already heard yesterday um, a very moving and detailed account of Hanan Ibrahim about the impact of war and occupation um, on women, specifically gender-based violence. So I'm not going to go into that. But what I'm trying to do is look at the more sort of the political dimension and also contextualize the issue of gender and war in the Iraqi context. And my main three arguments are the following. One is that despite the rhetoric about liberation of women, uh, well, coming from Bush and Blair, uh, women might actually be the biggest losers um, in all this. And I'm going to explain to you why I believe that might be the case. My second argument is that we can't just look at the situation of women and evolving changer, uh, gender relations and ideologies looking at 2003 and beyond. We have to look at the historical context. How was it before in Iraq? How did the Saddam Hussein regime, the various wars, economic sanctions impact women and gender relations? And then finally, I, and this I know will be quite controversial here, but I do believe that those of us who are committed to national unity in Iraq, we do have to acknowledge differences, and I'm going to elaborate on that um, in my conclusion. Now, theoretically speaking, looking at gender, gender of course refers to the social and cultural construction of what it means to be a man or woman, and we mainly look at gender ideologies, the ideas, the notions about the idea of man and woman, and then gender relations, the more material conditions. And it's very clear that it's never enough to just look at men and women as divisions. We have to look at intersecting factors. And in the Iraqi context, everyone speaks about ethnic and religious differences. But to my mind, what is often much more important is social class. We haven't talked about social class. But if you are, let's say, a Shia family, middle class family based in Baghdad, you probably have much more in common with your Sunni middle class neighbor than with um, impoverished Shia in Sadr city on the south of Iraq. So people are different, not just with respect to having different experiences based on their gender, on their religion, on their ethnicity, social class, and linked to all that. And I think that is very important and where I pledge that we need to really look more carefully into differences here, the way Iraqis have experienced the previous regime of course, very much colors their specific outlook on what is happening now. The other sort of theoretical point I'd like to raise is that historically and cross-culturally, and this has been documented in many different contexts, women are always used as the symbols of us versus them. Our women dress differently than your women. Our women behave properly and your women are loose women. Our women are liberated and your women are oppressed. And this is not unique to the Muslim world, it's not unique to the Bush regime. This has been going on. It's, it's sort of a universal fact. But I think that this is so important right now. I mean, looking at sort of the global security context, 
It was one of the main arguments for the invasion of Afghanistan. And I was very shocked uh, recently, I was involved in a radio debate with Charlotte Ponticelli from the State Department. And she actually said in, in the interview, in the debate, well, very few people know that um, Iraqi women under uh, Saddam Hussein regime were not allowed to go to university. And she, I mean, you know, you don't have to, do you have to distort history so much to make your point? I just couldn't believe it. And there was also an Afghani woman involved, and she obviously also contested what Charlo Ponticelli had to say about how wonderful women, women's lives were now in Afghanistan. But with, in the context of Iraq, and I was never a defender of Saddam Hussein, but it is the fact that in the 70s, Iraqi women were amongst the most educated in the region. And this is not because Saddam Hussein was a feminist or was adhering to egalitarian principles. This was very sort of um, a practical in the context of an economic boom and human power was needed instead of resorting to uh, importing human labor from outside as the other oil-rich countries did. Actually, the Iraqi regime mobilized its own human resources, 50% were women. And I think the other argument that's often made is for dictatorship, of course, it's much more easy to indoctrinate its citizens if they're out in the public sphere. And so that was another issue, you know, get women out in the public sphere, uh, and it's much easier to sort of involve them in, in the party and in, in the sort of state apparatus. Um, now, with respect to the symbolism, I think I'd like to sort of point out two threads. One is that in the context of Iraq, the symbolism of women changed rapidly from the 70s. In the 70s, women for the Ba'athi secular regime were the symbol of a progressive, progressing, developing, modernizing state. Right? Now in the 80s, during the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 88, things sort of moved into two parallel, although contrasting directions. On the one side, in any war, in most wars, actually what happens is that women are actually forced to do certain jobs that men didn't do. And although in the 70s women started to take up jobs, and I'm not just thinking about nurses and teachers, but they were engineers, they were taking all kinds of positions. But during the Iran-Iraq war, you could find women really literally everywhere doing all kinds of jobs because men were fighting. But at the same time, the state rhetoric and the symbolism of women changed slightly because women were also now the mother of the nation and the mother of the future soldiers. In a situation where there was a demographic imbalance between Iran and Iraq, it was very, few, very important that women would produce the future soldiers. So that had all kinds of implications in terms of very practical um, issues like um, abortions became uh, illegal. There were very, very generous maternity um, benefits and maternity leave paid up to one year. So really the state played an active role in promoting women not just to work, but also to produce future citizens. So there was a kind of, on the one side, you know, the, the worker, the, one, the, the woman who's filling in for the men who are fighting, but at the same time woman who is, um, who is actually the, the mother of the nation. Now again, in the 90s we see a shift in terms of the symbolism. And again, this is not unique to Iraq. In a situation where there's an economic crisis, in a situation where there's very large unemployment, women are pushed back. The good Iraqi woman should be at home, raise the children, you know, should stay with her husband. State rhetoric changed drastically. At the same time, you had a situation because of three wars after 91, because of um, because of the fact that many men had disappeared in prisons, were killed, executed, because of male out-migration. You have in some parts of Iraq during the 90s and until today, 60 to 70 percent female-headed households. And this is also in the context where there is a demographic imbalance between men and women. I mean, there are no concrete statistics, but people estimate that there are between 55 and 65 percent women which is an incredible demographic imbalance. Now in this context where you have an economic crisis, um, you have a, a state that cannot provide anymore, you have female-headed households, a large percentage, one of the things that happened is that prostitution 
um, increased in Iraq. At the same time, you had, of course, in the 90s, um, the regime changing its tone with respect to its previous commitment to secular policies. And the state in the sort of re famous religious campaign in the 90s uh, tried to portray itself as sort of promoter of religion. And this coming together, the state playing this role, and the fact that um, there was an increased social conservatism, a uh, push for women to go back, increased prostitution, women then became the symbol of the honor of the nation. So the women as the potential prostitute, the one to be protected, the one who has to dress properly to walk on the street, the one who, you know, if you walk on your own, you know, maybe people will speak badly about you. So a drastic change, and linked to that, of course, you had the um, beheading of uh, prostitutes um, in the 90s and uh, laws that did not allow Iraqi women to travel outside on their own. They had to have a, a legal male guardian uh, with them. Now, this is sort of to explain the historical context in Iraq. On top of that, you have now the symbolism coming from mainly Bush regime, but also Blair, which is, we are going to liberate the downtrodden, oppressed Iraqi women. And we're not just going to democratize the country, but we're going to liberate women. Now, imagine how this is going to clash now. I believe that actually what's happening now is that women are being crouched between these various rhetorics and symbolism. On the one side, you have, inside, within Iraq, of course, people trying to break with the previous regime. And the previous regime, despite its change in the 90s, is largely related to sort of secular policies. So that explains some of the increased social conservatism and Islamism in Iraq. On the other hand, of course, you have a resistance to this imposed so-called democratization and women's rights. And I think that the louder and the more people like Bush and Blair and others speak about women's rights in the context of occupation, I think the greater the backlash will be for women in Iraq. Although lots of people might actually not be opposed to women's education or women's labor force participation, but it's a kind of, it's a knee-jerk um, reaction. Now, this of course is a great dilemma for some of us who are committed to women's rights, who do not want an erosion of women's rights in Iraq, who feel that, yes, we should really you know, follow UN Resolution 1325, which calls for the mainstreaming of gender. But what shall we do? Shall we say this now? Shall we say this from the outside? What impact is this going to have women inside? Having said this, of course, as we heard yesterday and many times before, Iraqi men and women are not passive victims, and so they have been active, they have been reacting. And yesterday, Hanan uh, referred to the 25% quota, and she said, yeah, what is that? I, I would tend to differ here. I mean, I think that 25% you don't find anywhere in the world, actually. Um, I think maybe in Scandinavian countries. But the point is, actually, Iraqi women got this 25% despite the Americans and not because of them. Um, there was no attempt whatsoever by um, US or UK um, to actually in any way except for holding women's meetings. That was kind of their commitment to, to gender, you know, to gather women and have a women's conference. But in terms of actually involving women in governance and in sort of political transition, um, no, I mean, we, we don't do quota is what Paul um, Bremer said. And another, I forgot the name, but another general was said, we don't do women. So it is Iraqi women on the ground who actually pushed for a quota. And it was one of the um, first issues that mobilized Iraqi women. And I should say that when there was a kind of sort of window of opportunity in sort of 2003, for a few months, the first people who actually mobilized and came together and sort of started kind of mushrooming of civil society organizations was women. And one of the other issues that we haven't mentioned yet is that um, in December 2003, when the Iraqi Governing Council in one of its meetings came together, um, they did uh, try to pass a law uh, which is referred to as Article 137. And I think this 
this Article 137 was an attempt to change the relatively, relatively liberal and progressive existing family laws in Iraq, which had been in place since 1959 and then were endorsed again, I think, some point in the 70s by Saddam. When I say family laws, I mean laws that govern marriage, divorce, child custody. And in the context of the Middle East, you often have a situation where many laws are based on secular laws, but when it comes to the family laws, they're often based on, on the Sharia. And uh, in the context of Iraq, it was a quite sort of liberal interpretation. You know, for instance, that a man couldn't just divorce a woman or couldn't just marry another woman. He had to ask for the, the wife's permission. And one of the first things the governing council tried to do was to change that and revert it to a much more restrictive and conservative law. And again, I mean, this was, was one of the big issues that galvanized women and, and um, you know, brought them together. Um, now, in terms of the other issue, you know, looking at war theoretically, I, I don't have much time to go into that, but obviously I found um, Johann Galtung's concept of structural violence has been very useful for me and anyone interested in looking at gender-based um, violence. And not just, of course, looking at women, but also looking at how masculinities change. And this is both in the context of Iraq, of course, and other countries like the United States. Um, what is of course often happening is that in the context of war and conflict, um, women, are, uh, women tend to suffer gender specific ways and we've heard about some of them yesterday. Um, rape is often sort of the, the main way to, um, a sort of a, a way, main expression of gendered violence. And here I would say, like to say that this, of course, does not only affect women. Again, if you look at the <coughs> images, sorry, <coughs> the images of what happened in Abu Ghraib, I think that, again, in terms of gender ideologies and gender relations, I mean, the idea of a female American soldier sexually humiliating an Iraqi man, I think, is going to have an impact on um, sort of people's ideas about, well, what does it mean to be a liberated woman? And is this what happens to women when they're liberated in the West? I mean, obviously, I don't, I also have a problem with the fact that everyone was focusing on the women soldier. But I'm just saying, you know, I think that um, these issues do not just um, affect women, they also affect men. And uh, men who were affected by this sexual abuse also have an issue in terms of. Um, their violated masculinity and sense of honor. Now, fi finally, I'd like to say something about uh, the, my last uh, point in terms of it's important to recognize difference. I was very glad that Aisha mentioned um, resistance and the fact that I think we need to be a little bit more careful um, when we speak about the resistance. Um, Okay, I mean, we can, we can argue whether policemen or men who, you know, recruit to be policemen, whether they're collaborators and, you know, it's legitimate. I personally don't adhere to this, but, but what about, you know, hundreds, thousands of innocent civilians who are caught in these suicide bombs? And I don't believe for one second that um, many of these people who are involved in these kind of attacks actually have a free Iraq in mind. I think there are other agendas. But what I would like to concentrate on is that when I try to, to record life histories of Iraqi women, it's very obvious that different women had very different experiences with the previous regime. I don't think that we get anywhere by glossing over these differences. I don't think that we do national unity a favor uh, by saying things like, well, it's worse now in prisons than under Saddam. I think what we're doing when, I don't want to, to say, I, I don't think it's a wise route to go down to, to sort of compare suffering. I think that, although I agree that the United States and Britain are exasperating sectarian differences, they're using the divide and conquer theory, 
But I also believe that there are strong divisions in Iraqi society right now. And I also do not believe that if American troops and British troops would withdraw today, that things would just be all right, actually. I think that we need to listen carefully to the different stories of suffering. And in terms of alternative or future visions, I don't see how there can be unified Iraq if we don't have some sort of truth and reconciliation process. Um, in terms of divides, and particularly where women and gender are concerned, I think one of the big divides is going to be a sort of secular versus religious divide in Iraq. Um, and again, you know, for those of us who are committed to a secular country, with an free expression of religion for all, it is quite threatening that some of the resistance is actually very much crouched in, not just in religious, but in very specific extremist um, frameworks. And then finally, um, I'd like to say that um, I think one way forward, looking at the experiences of women in other conflict zones, in other sort of Reconstruction, I don't think that reconstruction is actually, actually happening uh, in Iraq. I mean, there's still a war going on. It's very, there's no space for reconstruction. But I think it, it would be good rather than sending these nonsensical gender advisors from the United States or Britain or Germany to Iraq. I think what, what would be good is to try to facilitate encounters with women from other countries like Bosnia, like Palestine, like Egypt, who went through similar experiences. Um, I think that would be a much more helpful way um, in terms of sharing experiences. Thank you. I would like to use my turn actually to ask a question to uh, Nadia. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation the UN Security Council Re the Resolution 1325, which is quite revolutionary in terms of having gender-based violence recognized in the international um, um, system. Uh, I wonder if there are specific ways in which the jury can use this resolution to um, think about what happened in Iraq, uh, both during the invasion and now the occupation. Uh, and I would like all of you, please, to limit your responses to three minutes as we've run out of time. Thank you. Right. Um, rather than sort of taking one question at a time, I'm just going to make some general comments because there was some overlap. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that in my written paper, I actually uh, concentrate more on the gender-based violence during occupation and war. But I felt that there would have been too much overlap, actually, with Hannah and Ibrahim papers, so when I spoke about uh, the relationship between economic and social reality, I was actually much more focusing on the period prior to this war. And my argument was that we don't understand the situation of women now by not contextualizing it historically, because one of the things, of course, economic sanctions, there exists this amnesia about it. And there is, of course, a big gap to what happened between the 70s and 2003 where women are concerned. And I was just trying to fill that gap because I felt that all the atrocities that are happening now on occupation have been covered much better by other speakers before. So that, that's just a, a point of clarification. The other point I'd like to say, I didn't say that we should not support the resistance. Actually, what I... Um, I'm trying to say is that for me personally, I, I feel that I would like to differentiate between different elements of the resistance. And I um, think it's, a very different, it's very difficult to answer the first um, person's question about how to qualify it. I can tell you what I would not support. I would not support um, what I think is actually largely not driven by Iraqis, but I think by outside forces, um, the, the killings of innocent Iraqis. And whether you want to include policemen with it, that it's your choice. I mean, I personally would include them, but I see that this is a controversial. But certainly, I'm thinking about incidents like in Karbala and, you know, where hundreds of men, women, and children die. And I think 
the re I mean, I think what the motivation behind this is actually not to liberate Iraq, but to divide Iraq and actually um, to create further sectarianism. Now, I think that there are lots of divisions in Iraq and the secular and religious is one of many and often in the context of, for instance, those people who are part of the, the government now, it's not the most important one. It's, there's, there are divisions of you know, whether to collaborate or not, whether you were pro-war or not, how to relate to the Americans. But I think that what is evident, what I'm trying to say is, and I'm also, of course, asking for the withdrawal of US forces. I didn't say that I'm not, but I'm saying I don't think everything would be okay. I, what I'm saying is that there are deep divisions in society that have been increased by the occupation, by the policies of the US. But they were there before. Iraq, of course, my father, who left Iraq in the 50s, always speaks about the fact that he never knew whether his father was Shia or Sunni or Kurdish and Christian and everyone was just Iraqi. But the Iraq in the 90s was a different Iraq. And I think that we don't do national unity justice by not recognizing that there are differences. And whether we agree or not that certain parts of the population suffered more or not, we have to recognize that certain elements like, I'm thinking particularly the Kurds and Shia, have a feeling that they were singled out as a group. And unless we kind of work through this, I don't think that national unity um, you know, is, is a possibility. Um, as for the, um, I, I never actually said, I spoke about beheadings of resistance. I spoke about sort of beheadings during the Saddam Hussein period. But there are lots of accounts how, again, specific elements of the insurgents and uh, have been intimidating women. And, you know, there are lots of incidents. For instance, there was an incident in Basra where a group of students um, were sitting sort of celebrating and there was a big massacre. Um, lots of women who fear that they can't walk on the streets, you know, with, without wearing the hijab. I mean, I'm not, I don't think we should sort of get stuck on the hijab. I'm never sort of, I don't want to go down that route, but I think there is, there is harassment, there's increased sort of restriction of movement, there's social conservatism. Hey, Zahid Sharaba, hey, Le 